welcome to the first episode of season four of the Australian Naval History podcast series, where we examine an event or aspect of the Royal Australian Navy's history. The series is produced by the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales campus at the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra. The Naval Studies Group is supported in this series by the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society of Australia, and the Submarine Institute of Australia. Hello, I am Peter Jones, a retired Vice Admiral, and now a member of the Navy Studies Group. This is the first of two episodes in which we discuss the deeds of an elite part of the Royal Australian Navy, namely its mine clearance divers. To discuss this topic, I'm joined by three retired mine clearance divers and mine warfare specialists. They are Commodore Heck Donoghue, who co-authored United and Undaunted, The First 100 Years, a history of diving in the Royal Australian Navy, 1911 to 2011, and most recently, the book Australian Minesweepers at War. Also, Commander Jake Linton, who among other things, Jake commanded a, a clearance diving team in the Vietnam War. And finally, Lieutenant Commander Doug Moore, who, as we will hear, took part in a range of operations during this period. And Doug was awarded the George Medal for his bravery during the HMAS Melbourne Voyager collusion. Thank you all for joining me. First off, Heck Don Hugh, um, where were divers first introduced into the Royal Australian Navy and what was their role? Divers have always been present in Australia's naval forces going back to the colonial days. In the Australian War Memorial, there's a photograph of a group from New South Wales Naval Brigade, circa 1890, donated by the granddaughter of Seaman Albert Cordroy. Her mother told her that Cordroy was one of the first seamen to be given diver training in the Naval Brigade. This would have been done by the Royal Navy's Australian Station Auxiliary Squadron out here at the time. It's important to remember that divers in the beginning of the last century wore the cumbersome hard hat and canvas suit equipment, which allowed them only very limited manoeuvrability underwater. Their main role was underwater searches, limited underwater ship maintenance, and the ability to assist in salvage operations. Their role as a diver was secondary, and it was a part-time qualification known as a cuff rate. When needed, they had proved valuable and the diving capability was seen as necessary in the REM. The results of Australia's naval expansion commenced in 1909 were evident when the Battle Cruiser Australia, Light Cruiser Sydney, arrived in Australia from UK in October 1913 and together with the cruiser's encounter in Melbourne and three destroyers made a triumphant entry into Sydney on the 4th of October. Following Royal Navy practice, all cruisers included a small diving capability of one or two, and in the first instance, the Australian divers were trained in UK. An example of one of these divers was Carpenter William White, who, while serving an HMS encounter, dived on, dived on the SS Cumberland after, hit, after it hit a German mine off Gabo Island in 1917. White had joined the RAN in 1912, qualified as an artificer a diver in UK, in June 1913. He ultimately was promoted to shipwright lieutenant commander in 1937, retired in 53, having been awarded the MB in 1941 for his long and distinguished service to the RAN. By the end of World War II, there were a total of 22 divers in the RAM. In 1950, a post-war policy on diving capability established the need for some 60 divers to be allocated throughout the fleet and certain establishments. Supervision of diving was undertaken by, at that point by commissioned gunners. It was recognised it may take time to meet the planned establishment of divers and in the event the introduction of clearance diving and the cessation of standard diving training in 1960, this polity became redundant. So heck, as a follow-up, can you outline the evolution of diving training during and post-World War One? Yeah, sure. Again, following RN practice, responsibility for diving was vested in the gunnery branch, and when it was decided to establish Diving Training Australia, Williamstown Naval Depot, 
in Victoria, also known as HMO Cerberus, became the centre for training. The RN was very lucky to have gunner Arthur Greening, who instructed the first diving course. Greening, in the, Nor in the Royal Navy, had qualified as a diver in 1906 and was lent to the RAN in 1912 at the rank of Petty Officer, transferring to the RAN in 1914. He, promoted, he was promoted to gunner in November 1916 and acted as instructor for the first diving course held at Cerberus from November 1916 through to January, end of January 1917. Eight sailors qualified and one completed the course as a refresher. The 920 gunboat Protector was used as a diving platform. Training relocated to Flinders Naval Depot, also commissioned as Cerberus, after it opened in 1920. Fleet destroyers or sloops were used as diving platforms to enable diving to be conducted in deeper waters, normally in Port Phillip Bay. The courses lasted about two months where divers working their way down to 140 feet underwater. In 1929, with the reduction in the size of the Navy following the war, the availability of suitable tenders to support diving training from Flinders was in doubt and training moved to Sydney where deep water was available in the harbour and smaller boats could be used. Courses were conducted from HMAS Penguin 3, moored at Garden Island, and some seven courses were run through to 1935. In 1946, the RAN rationalised the organisation of its divers and transferred the responsibility for diving training to the torpedo branch. In Sydney, base diving training moved to Chowder Bay in Sydney Harbour with Penguin as its ferret establishment and diving boat Otter as its platform. Following the formation of the Torpedo and Anti-Submarine Branch in 1948, training moved from the old Torpedo School at Flinders to HMAS Rushcutter in Sydney. The next year, diving training was co-located with Torpedo and Anti-Submarine Training at Rushcutter with commissioned gunner Jackie Homewood running the diving school. He was to become a play, key player in diving training through the 50s and remained as OIC of the school through to 1957, retiring in the rank of Lieutenant Commander and being awarded the MBE in December 60 for distinguished service. So, uh, Jake Linton, can you describe some of the notable diving operations during World War II? Certainly. Uh, well, there were a number of them and... Uh... Just to outline a few, the first was with shipwright Donald McEachan Haddow. He died on the 22nd of April 1941 while serving in HMAS Perth and drowned while on loan to HMS York to assess battle damage to the hull. He was dressed in standard diving dress, minus the helmet, and seated in a boat alongside the York at anchor in Suda Bay Creek when a near miss by a bomb overturned the boat and he consequently drowned. I can't think of a much worse way to go. Another petty officer, Humphreys, George Medal, had been a commercial diver prior to World War II and had worked on the Gray and Story bridges in Brisbane. He had joined the RAN in 1918 as a boy seaman and transferred to the Royal Australian Fleet Reserve in 1938. He was recalled to full-time service in 1939 and posted to HMS, later HMAS, Canimbla. Although not qualified as a naval diver, he volunteered for diving duties whilst the ship was in the Persian Gulf. During salvage operations on the prize ship Hohenfels, Petty Officer Humphreys conducted 12 dives into the flooded engine room to shut Phil's suction valves. These dives required a descent down three long ladders to the level of the starting platform, thence forward the length of the engine room, and down another two short ladders to the tunnels under the bunker. The length of air hose needed was at least 120 feet. There were no communications with the surface, and had anything gone wrong, there was no hope of survival. Petty Officer Humphreys completed the task with a call for great skill and courage, and as a result, was immediately granted the non-substantive rating of Diver First Class and was awarded the George Medal. Leading Seaman Fenimore, DSM. 
born in the UK, Harry Fenimore joined the RN in 1916 and saw active service in World War I. He was lent to the RAN in 1920 and transferred in 1930, having qualified as a diver in 1925. Fenimore was loaned to the RN in 1941 for diving in the Suez Canal with the RN Canal Mine Clearance Party at Port Said. He was given a course in RMS. During his tenure with the party, he rendered safe a German GD mine, which lay between three ships in the canal. He had no way of knowing the mine was of an acoustic variety, and it was known that this particular mine could be actuated by the noise from bubbles from a surface-supplied diving helmet. He was awarded the George Medal for his efforts. But he also Bullard and Stoker Roy Coop together on the night of the 31st of May 1942 were recalled to duty and employed recovering bodies from the wreck of Cuttable, a Sydney ferry used for accommodation and which was moored at Garden Island. During the operation, they were called away to investigate the possible discovery of one of the Japanese submarines that had been responsible for the sinking of Cuttable. The first midget submarine, 21, was found with its propeller still turning in Taylor Bay, Sydney Harbour, and the second, second midget 14 entangled by its propeller in the boom net which enclosed Sydney Harbour. And last but not least, Chief, Chief Petty Officer Shipwright W. Johnston was an artisifer diver, granted a leave of absence without pay, I'm at that, from RAN Active Service from October 1940 to January 1942. This is to assist his brother John Johnson in the recovery of gold bullion from the wreck of SS Niagara, which sank off the east coast of New Zealand after hitting a mine. On successful completion of the task, he was promoted sub-lieutenant and returned to active service. And the trials and tribulations of the task are well documented in the book Gold from the Sea by James Taylor. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Um, Hector on here, can you outline how clearance diving in the REN actually began? Right. Well, during, towards the end of the war, the Royal Navy established port clearance parties, or P parties, which uh, followed the invasion into Europe and cleared the ports and harbours. Uh, they were disbanded in uh, late 1945, but one P party remained, based at HMS Vernon, to deal with residual suspected unexploded ordnance around the UK coast. And in 1948, the Royal Navy determined that P party divers would henceforth be known as clearance divers. In Australia, Lieutenant Commander Maury Batterham who'd actually commanded a P party in Europe during World War II and had conducted extensive bomb and mine disposal activities during the war and post-war, was serving in Navy office. And he initiated the requirement to establish a similar organisation in the REN. He raised the proposal in January 1951. He was supported by the naval staff who were responsible for policy issues and it was approved by the first naval member Vice Admiral Sir John Collins on the 2nd of February 1951. Arising from this, it was agreed that Batterham would be sent to UK in early 1951 to learn the latest developments in the clearance diving field. In preparation for Batterham's report, Navy Office promulgated a confidential Commonwealth Navy order on the 21st of June 1951, advising that the specialist qualification of clearance diver was hereby introduced into the RAN. Of interest, the initial staff work and subsequent policy direction was done by a Lieutenant Commander, Tony Sinnott, then Director of Training and Staff Requirements, and later Admiral and Chief of Naval Staff in the late 70s and Chief of Defence Force in the early 80s. Other players involved in the decision were the Director of Manning, Captain Harrington, later Vice Admiral and Chief of Naval Staff in the early 60s. He agreed personnel could be provided, but wisely suggested to wait until the necessary equipment was available. Two other players, Captain 
the Deputy Chief of Navy, Naval Staff, Captain McNichol, later Vice Admiral and Chief of Naval Staff in the late 60s, supported the proposal, as did the second Naval member, Commodore Roy Dowling, later Vice Admiral and Chief of Naval Staff in the 1950s. So with initial support from four of the future Chiefs of Naval Staff over the following 28 years, the introduction of clearance diving had to succeed. Batterham returned to Navy office in December 51 and was the driving force behind most of the policy decisions related to clearance diving, even though his directorate was responsible for procurement. He planned a six-month clearance diving course to be conducted when equipment was available. In 1955, the clearance diving breathing apparatus was finally made available to the RAN and the first formal RAN CD course was conducted with 11 CDs qualifying. Standard diving ceased in 1960 and that form of diving lapsed in the RAN from June that year. The introduction of clearance diving marked a transformation of diving in the RAN. It recognised the increase in range and competencies required of clearance divers and their associated skills. The clearance diver, unlike the standard diver, was to be employed full time in his specialist qualification. And up till that time, diving in the RN was run by commissioned gunners. But with the introduction of a much more qualified clearance diver, commissioned officers were seen as necessary to manage diving. Jake Lynn, you were a member of that first uh, clearance diving course. Can you describe how it went? Yes, certainly. Uh, the course consisted of 17 participants, uh, two officers, one already qualified as a standard diver, and 16 ratings from petty officer to AB, some with right arm rates, some without. We were most fortunate, just to reiterate what uh, Hector has mentioned, to have Lieutenant Commander Batterham as our guiding light, as, we, as he had gained a wealth of experience. And as a result, he used confidence and had sufficient experience to coach the new breed into a cohesive force and lay the groundwork for today's CD. We formed at HMAS Rushcutter and were immediately dispatched by the standard divers to a concrete ammunition lighter, which had been modified as accommodation, store and workshop, and diving platform, and moored off the western side of Clark Island in Sydney Harbour. Our instructor, or more aptly described as our supervisor, was a TAS gunner who had qualified as a diver in the UK. My memory of the course is of long days without much direction, other than to get as much time underwater as possible, walking the seabed and compass swimming. The equipment was new to all, including our supervisor, and we learnt the vagaries of its use and maintenance by reading the RN instructional manual. The main equipment was a self-contained rebreather that could be configured for oxygen or mixed gas diving, it was non-magnetic to enable its use in mine identification and disposal. The second set was a variation of the standard diving dress manufactured from non-magnetic materials and was also self-contained. After some months on pure diving training, we transferred to the School of Military Engineering at Casula on the outskirts of Liverpool, New South Wales for demolition and bomb and mine disposal training. This was conducted by two Army warrant officers and took the form of World War II methods. And on completion of our training, 11 survived and most of us were posted to sea. Thank you. Uh, Doug Moore, can you describe how the clearance diving branch and the diving teams developed post the 1950s? Yes, uh, uh, during the 50s and 60s, the branch was consolidating. The first course, uh, the first course they um, they basically got the know-how that we do the equipment and then from there on each, each other course uh, developed new techniques and carried out more training or difficult training. Where the, there was a gradual num uh, increase in numbers. I qualified clearance diver in 1957 and at the time the branch was only about 30 strong. 
Um, I do not know what the numbers were in the late 60s, but I feel sure that they have had not increased dramatically. General diver numbers, so we then went into compressed air divers as well for non-CDs, uh, with the training of ships' compressed air divers in the fleet, uh, ex would have expanded the total diver, diver numbers. And that, then the numbers would have become impressive. All ships have a diving team, which should have included one or more CDs, clearance diver, as a, uh, uh, not as a supervisor particularly, but as a, um, a mentor, Sufficiently large enough to carry out a ship search of a bottom in 30 min in 20 minutes, a significant improvement in what was available in the 50s, and with the improved number of divers available, new two techniques were developed, and the fleet commander would have been able to sleep better at night. Vietnam was the wake-up call for the RAN. We now had a visible threat, where before it was all happening somewhere. Far away. Thank you. So, Doug, uh, we'll get to Vietnam shortly, but uh, as a follow-up, can you describe the, uh, the work the, the, the divers did in the uh, Snowy Mountains as part of the uh, Snowy Mountain Scheme, where both you and Jake were uh, awarded British Empire medals? Uh, in about 1961, the Navy was asked if it would be possible to investigate why the Snowy Mountain Authority could not fully close one of its very important gates on the strainer outlet tower in Lake Eukambeen. The Eukambeen Dam is an earth-filled dam and water to the rest of the snowy system is released from it via a 10-metre tunnel which has two large gates in the centre of the dam to regulate the flow of the water down the system. Now, when maintenance on these gates is necessary, the gates at the inlet tower have to be closed to isolate the outlet tunnel. The gates at the tower are correctly called stop logs. They're not a gate, they're just a system of, of um, one foot square beams, uh, 10 feet long. I've, I'm using old, old figures, that's what happened then with a brass and rubber seal, and they're stacked 10 at a time to, to make half a gate, and there are two gates. The, the stop logs, these stop logs, are lowered one at a time down one of the two slots in the concrete to the bottom of the 220-foot tower, and they are waterproof gates. The log stop logs are raised and lowered into the slot position by a steel grab. Apparently... The problem was that when the stop logs were in position, there was still a flow of water two foot or more deep in the tunnel. Various solutions were employed by the Snowy Mountains Authority to try and... They used ad hoc methods to try and stop these leaks. They couldn't stop them. But then when they tried to get the stop logs back up, they couldn't pick them up. The grab wouldn't pick them up. Now, in 1961... Diving in hel on helium was in its infancy. We didn't have it. And there was little, if any, available to anybody in the world. Now, for very good reasons, the maximum safe depth for diving on air had been set at 240 feet, um, 70 metres. Uh, the depth the SMA were looking at was 90 metres. So we were going to be 20 metres deeper than what the safe depth for the air was. And at the same time, the deepest dive in the world at that time was by a bloke called George Wookie of New Zealand in UK to, to um, uh, 300 feet, which is 100 metres. Now, the situation was serious. If the SMA had to release the water from the Newcombean Dam to fix these, stock, these gates... There was nine times the water in Sydney Harbour contained within that dam. And you can imagine the cost and the anguish. The RAN accepted the challenge and using an ad hoc diving rig made up by Australian divers in Melbourne and a Jacques Cousteau rubber suit 
designed for use in the sewers of Paris, a team was formed at the diving school to attempt the task. Some members of the team during the task had minor diving and domestic problems. These were replaced with new divers and the task was completed just as the snow started to fall. The problems, the problems faced by decom were decompression sickness, the bends, nitrogen narcosis, raptures of the deep, high levels of carbon dioxide poisoning, cold, forced absence of alcohol and aerated drinks for three to four months, among other minor things. Okay. A dive at the bottom was played out as follows. 20 minutes to get into the rig. Three minutes to plunge to the bottom. 17 minutes working time on the bottom trying to find the problem. And 90 minutes decompression, 90 minutes plus actually, decompression with five minutes to get out of the rig and get ready to attend the next diver. The total cost of the RAN, five cents a minute diving pay and three British Empire medals. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doug. Um, Heck, Don, can you uh, explain the envisaged missions of the RN clearance diving teams during the Cold War? Yeah, certainly. Following, again, following the Royal Navy lead, clearance divers were seen as shallow water mine countermeasures operators where they could both search for mines and ultimately dispose of them. From the RAN perspective, although the capability was endorsed at the highest level, the initial employment of clearance divers was very much left to themselves. This was a period when recreation, before recreational diving became popular and diving was considered slightly unusual and little understood in the general naval area. As Doug has said, the branch was small and by 1960 it had grown to 50 people but their outstanding performance in a number of civil incidents established the clearance diving reputation as a professional group able to successfully manage the dangerous and the unusual. These tasks included the Australian National Airways helicopter recovery from Melton Weir in 1960, the TAA Fokker Friendship salvage off Mackay in the same year, the recovery of a RWF F-86 Sabre off Darwin in 1961, the Vickers Viscount recovery in Botany Bay in 61, and as Doug had just described, the deep diving assistance to the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Authority in Lake Eucopene in 1961. The other operational requirement in the fleet was the need to have a capable defence against underwater swimmer attack. This saw the deployment of clearance divers to fleet ships, as well as the introduction of ship divers. In addition, the clearance diving team conducted ship attack to exercise the ships in this form of warfare. The RAN participation in confrontation with Indonesia in the mid-60s and the deployment of a clearance diving team provided valuable exposure to operational conditions and tested their training techniques and equipment. They acquitted themselves well and in, in, in 65, the clearance diving team was integrated with the Mine Countermeasures Squadron at HMAS Waterhen and the next year, 1966, were nominated, their, their name was changed to Clearance Diving Team 1. At the conclusion of World War II, a large amount of ordnance remained in the islands, posing a significant threat to local communities. Disposal of these explosive remnants of war became a regular activity for Clearance Diving Team 1 from 1967 initially in Papua New Guinea and later in Kiribati and the Solomons. And as will be discussed shortly, a small clearance diving team, CDT-3, was deployed to Vietnam in 1967. In 1969, it was recognised that CDT-1 was now an important element of the fleet, deploying regularly overseas and was included formally in the fleet program, lifting its status to that of a fleet unit. OK, thanks, Hit. Um so, Jake Lyndon, if I can just backtrack a little bit, um, it was said that in the 1950s that there was a renaissance in diving in the REN. Can you explain and particularly uh, just talk a bit about the Australian-developed diving equipment? 
Well, um, the Renaissance was really a move from standard diving dress being tethered to the surface with a surface supply hose and a lifeline and very little means of capability to move around. When the clearest diving specialisation was introduced, the RAN completely adopted the RN developed clearance diving apparatus number 5561A and the mine recovery suit. Both were self-contained breathing apparatuses. And these were a giant leap forward, as up until that time, the only form of self-contained diving practiced by the RAN was using the Selvis oxygen breathing apparatus modified for diving and the Davis submarine escape apparatus. Selvis was the firefighting and damage control breathing equipment and uh, the Davis Submarine Escape Apparatus was, as its name implies, developed for submarine escape. Up until 1955, the main equipment used by the RAN had been C.B. Gorman standing dress and, uh, and salvage. In the early to mid-1950s, Lieutenant Commander Morris Batterham again, who had been the architect of our appearance diving into the RAN, began developing a version of self-contained compressed air breathing apparatus, which was a world first, changing the early version of twin hose regulator to a single hose regulator with demand valve separate. More efficient, more economical on gas, and much more comfortable to use. The design was completed by a Melbourne firm, Australian divers, Fire. The unit was designated as a compressed air breathing apparatus, or CABA, and it could be used in the single or twin cylinder configuration. It was completely adopted by the RAN. The CABA was quickly followed by the SSBA, surface supplied breathing apparatus, which was used, which used the same demand valve from CABA, connected by high pressure hose to a portable compressor with that air reservoir or later years by a separate regulator supplying air from high pressure capacity pre-filled air cylinders. All these equipments have since been superseded by upgraded versions and newer developments and you would not recognise them today but mostly what is used in the RAN today has been sourced from a source from overseas suppliers. Jack Linton, were there any particular incidents and personalities that we should mention during these early years? And uh, can you also just talk about the introduction of the term explosive ordnance disposal or EOD? Well, yes, certainly. Uh, there's personalities first, I think. Um, there are many in every style of character that you can imagine. But in each instance, I would say they possessed a high degree of self-confidence and found their particular niche in the diving world. Jackie Homewood has been discussed at length, but there was one chap even older than him, a fellow by the name of Lieutenant Fred Lowry. He was born in 1882 and joined the RAN in 1916. He remained at Cerberus until 1918 when he was selected for officer training in UK and he was promoted gunner in 1920. In 1942, he was promoted lieutenant for service in the Persian Gulf on HMAS Canimbla at the same time as Petty Officer Humphreys received his GM for the salvage of Hohenfeld. And it is reasonable to extrapolate that Larry was involved in that operation. He was appointed as Sydney Port Diving Officer in 1942 and spent the remainder of World War II in the post retiring in 946. Although his service certificate show him as being promoted Lieutenant Commander and retiring in 1957 at 75 years of age. Fred must have been involved in the finding and recovery of the uh, major submarines, also depth charges that were laid in Sydney Harbour and anything that had to do with diving within Sydney Harbour during World War II. Lieutenant Commander Batterham has been well and truly covered up to date 
Uh, so I won't go into him again other than to say he was awarded the OBE for courage and devotion to duty. He was loaned to the RN, the six-month service and training in 1951, returned to Australia and was the key player in the introduction of the RAN clearance diving brand. He retired in 1966 as a commander and to continue a diving career in the commercial world. Another chapter of note, Lieutenant Commander Ronald Mervyn Titcom, MBE. Ron Titcom, nicknamed Breastbrush for various reasons, was one of the founding members of the RAN CD branch and qualified as a CDO during the first course in 1955. He was born in 1930 and joined the RANR as a midshipman in 1948. He was promoted sub-lieutenant in 52, lieutenant in 54, and was commissioned as a lieutenant in the PNF in 1955. He had served in the Merchant Marine prior to joining the RAM. Sitcom qualified as a standard diver in 1953. In 1960, whilst on exchange duty with the RN, he was appointed OIC of the RN of the RM clearance diving team, attached to the RN underwater detection establishment, and on completion of a TAS officers course at HMS Groom. He was awarded the MBE when his team recovered a crashed helicopter from 170 feet of water, the first operational use of clearance divers, or Viet RN, to that depth. Returning to Australia, he was promoted Lieutenant Commander in 62. During the early years of the RANCD branch, Titkin was in Navy office and played an important role in the development of the branch. He then retired to pursue a very successful career in the commercial diving world and oil industry. And they roll on. Chief Petty Officer CD, Leo, Robert, or Sandy Brennan. No record of characters in the RAN CD branch would be complete without mention of Sandy Brennan. Sandy joined the RAN in 46 after a stint in the RAAF. He then qualified diver third class in 52, second class in 54, before converting to clearance diver late in 55. Sandy's claim to fame was not for any particular event or operation, but rather his manner. At every stage of his career, he stood out amongst his peers. Nothing was too much trouble, whether it was the task at hand or assisting a contemporary. He was seen as a role model by many, not only within the diving world, but also across the naval experience, and was known as Sandy by Admiral and ordinary seamen alike. Though sparsely educated, his efforts took him through the ranks to Chief Petty Officer, and his achievements were admired by all. Sandy always led by example, and his efforts in no small way helped to produce the high degree of esteem and camaraderie the CD branch enjoys today. Another ex-standard diver, Chief Petty Officer CD, Raymond Campbell, or Dixie Ford, BEM. As an aside, Dixie's son, Warrant Officer C.D. Ford, and grandson, Petty Officer C.D. Andrew Campbell, followed him into the Navy and the C.D. branch, and a granddaughter, Chief Petty Officer Underwater Medicine, Victoria Brading, into the Underwater Medicine Specialisation. Dixie joined the Navy in 1945 and initially joined the gunnery branch. The diving called and he quickly moved through Firstly, the standard diving qualification, then dive the sea to the cliff diving branch. He was the first RAN sailor to qualify clearance diver first class. A long way, along the way, he was awarded the BEM in 1955 in the wardroom of HMS Victory for his role in the recovery of sea cadets drowned while serving in HMS, HMAS Melbourne. He was held in great esteem by all his contemporaries and helped establish explosive ordnance disposal training within the Navy. This training had been carried out at the Army School of Military Engineering prior. And in association with scientist Mike Turner of the RAN Experimental Laboratory, he developed the Australian Mine 
warfare ide mine identification system. And in 19, that was in 1962. And it remained in RAM service until the 1980s. Like Sandy, Dixie was a role model within the diving community and he laid the foundation of respect and acknowledged professionalism and EOD <clears throat> and IED experience that RANCDs enjoy today. Another Chief of the Officer, William Terence Bill Fitzgerald, soon to be 90 years of age, this month in fact. Bill joined the RAN in 1947 from a naval family and enjoyed an early career in the TAS branch rising to POUW. He volunteered to join the RAN's first CD course in 1955 and served as a demolitions instructor during the course. Apart from a stint on board HMAS Melbourne, he served the majority of his remaining time in the service involved in the diving school, retiring in 1966. During the first CD course, there was some friction between the old guard, the standard divers, and the new boys, and a belief in some that it would never take off. Bill was a man of strong character and served as a buffer between the new chums and the old guard. He also assumed the role of sea daddy to the younger members of the course and has maintained that role to successive generations of the branch. He is held in great esteem by members of the branch, past and present, and continues to play a role at graduation ceremonies in the 64 years of its existence. I would doubt that there is any CD in the branch who has not experienced his influence. I could go on and add name after name to this list of CDs. They've held many positions in the RAN, up to and including the Fleet Commander and the Chief of Naval Staff. Thank you. The term, the term ID, DOD, was born of sending two clearance diving officers, Clem Littleton and Ross Blue, for EOD training at the USN EOD school, Indian Head in Maryland, USA, during the 1960s. Their experience, followed by a complete revamp of our training, that bomb and mine disposal in the past, and the introduction of an EOD segment to the CD course. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jake. Um, Doug Moore, the, the, the training of clearance divers is renowned as being particularly arduous. Can you explain what it involved in the early years and, and how it evolved from those, those first couple of courses? Uh, the training of the CDs has evolved with the threat the early training methods uh, from 55 on were carried out along Royal Navy lines and were aided by two-year exchange officers from the Royal Navy. So they were qualified CDOs who came over here and we sent somebody over there to, boot, to have a two-year training with them in their organisation. Training initially focused on fitness and getting familiarised with all the known forms of equipment plus the use of searches using World War II methods. During the history, a move away from the RN methods came with updated searches and equipment and threats changed and the new ideas were examined. The RAN CD branch became of age. The course in itself is a very physical course. It is designed to test the metal of the person doing the course, how he will fit in with the team. It is no good training somebody who is an individual. They must be between team members. They must have the, the safety of their t other team members with them and they must be loyal. And apart from that, that's basically how the training courses run. Thank you. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, so, heck, can you explain the difference between a clearance diver and a ship's diver, and when did the capabilities come into the RN service? Right. In, essence, in essence, a ship's diver is a part-time diver who's completed a short course of a couple of weeks in compressed air diving equipment, whereas a clearance diver is a professional diver and explosive ordnance disposal expert who completes a much longer course of many months. 
As Jake has described the introduction of the compressed air breathing apparatus and the surface supplied breathing apparatus in the uh, mid 50s, proved that such equipment could be very useful on board a ship. And so the concept of ship divers arose with the first formal course conducted in November 1957. The ship's diving team became a valuable asset for routine maintenance as well as assisting or contributing to defence against swimmer attack. Officers and sailors from all branches could apply as a ship's diver. The course was three weeks and involved basic underwater searches, routine underwater maintenance, ship's hull searches, and was uh, conducted um, on a regular basis. <laughs> Diving was restricted to 66 feet and officers completing the course were also qualified as diving supervisors. Since their introduction, ship divers have been a mainstay and support to the clearance diving branch and have assisted in many major tasks carried out by CDs. The recovery of the Fokker Friendship aircraft that crashed off Mackay in 1960 is an operation where ship divers from Warrego, who was there at the time, carried out the main part of the task until support, till the clearance divers arrived from Sydney. The ship's divers have also proved invaluable in providing the routine diving support needed on board naval ships, both in Australia waters and more importantly, when deployed overseas. Sadly, that is all we have time for in this, the first episode on clearance diving teams. My thanks to Heck Donahue, Doug Moore and Jake Linton. In the next episode, we will discuss the service of the RN clearance diving teams in confrontation, operations in Southwest Pacific, and also their operations during the Vietnam War. Thank you for joining us. And for more information on the Australian Naval History podcast series, simply search for Naval Studies Group in your search engine. Goodbye for now.